Welcome to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. In this episode, we explore the Bay Area housing market and how mass corporate ownership of homes and apartments throughout the region affects communities and people trying to afford to rent or buy here. My guest is Susie Nielsen, data reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle, covering housing, domestic migration, and crime and criminal justice. Susie, along with a team at the San Francisco Chronicle, recently released a series of reports on corporate and LLC real estate ownership and created an interactive map of who owns property in the Bay Area, an amazing feat of data reporting. The series also includes maps of the real estate owned or controlled by a handful of corporate LLCs that can be traced back to a specific power player. Welcome, Susie. So I really want to delve into housing, and this is something I've been interested in for a while because I think it starts with I hear, um, oh, lack of supply, lack of supply. We need to build more. We need to build more. But it always feels like that's a little bit oversimplified. And the reporting you and your team recently did on who owns what in the Bay Area really starts to get at this question I've had. So I'm I'm wondering if you could maybe start by giving us kind of a general picture of the housing market in the Bay Area based on some of the reporting you've done recently. There's no question that the Bay Area is constrained by a lack of housing supply. I think a lot of different factors contribute to that. A lot of people here are very invested in having their property values stay high, and they tend to be very politically active as well. So they're the people who are voting, and they're the people that are getting involved in local politics a lot of the time. I think when you have people who can't afford to live somewhere, they also can't get involved in politics at the local level. So there's definitely that element. Um, The state of California also has a lot of Um, different laws already on the books that make it hard to build housing, including CEQA, which is environmental regulations around housing. Um, And then different jurisdictions have different local things going on. But I think lack of supply being the only issue is definitely oversimplifying it. Um, For one thing, the, the words lack of supply can mean different things. So, you know, A lot of people who are pro-building all forms of housing um, are criticized because they don't necessarily focus enough on affordable housing, for example. So there are, for example, a lot of vacant market rate units in certain places, and a lot of people can't afford them. So how does that look in the Bay Area? The Bay Area's overall vacancy rate, uh, which is the number of housing units sitting vacant at any given time, tends to be lower than the majority of the country, but there still are a lot of homes, you know, that are sitting vacant in certain places. So one example, I mean, I don't know if you were following the Moms for Housing activism that happened uh, a couple years back, but some um, unhoused mothers in um, Oakland occupied a vacant home owned by a corporate owner to show that, you know, there are these houses on the market that could be rented out to families, but corporations would rather keep them vacant and, you know, not rent them out to lower income folks and wait until they can have a more wealthy, high income buyer or renter. The economics work out better that way sometimes. Prop M is in, in San Francisco is trying to get at that issue. Like these, ha- these units are sitting vacant. So, hey, let's tax the vacancy as one effort to try to get these things rented so that people have a place to to live. Prop M is definitely the kind of measure that could have a lot of impact because one of the reasons that corporate owners can keep homes vacant is because they don't have to pay super high taxes on that home. Um, And a vacancy tax could incentivize owners to take vacant homes and get them occupied. Unfortunately, I think the current measure M as it stands A city controller study actually found that it would only get 250 new housing units onto the market because for some reason, I don't know why, the current measure as it stands would exclude single family homes and duplexes, um, which tend to be the majority of vacant housing. The Chronicle editorial board, which I am not connected to, but their position is that wait for a better vacancy tax. You could argue both ways that this is like a good stopgap measure, interim measure, or that we should wait till something better happens. Something else that y- you mentioned about who controls the, the, the rules, the laws, the regulations, the policy 
Um, and often it is those who, one, have time to get engaged in local politics and people who can afford to be in the spaces. And and I remember, you know, years ago, it was it was during the 2008 recession, and I was thinking, oh, I'll buy myself a little house. I can afford this now. And I was looking at a bunch of houses in Oakland, and I remember there was one day in – it was March 2009, I believe, and I was looking, and all of a sudden, like, 120 houses, like, it was a, more than 100 just disappeared off the map. And I'm like, wait, I was looking at, like, four or five of those. And then in a pay, it was either the East Bay Times or the Chronicle, I can't remember who covered it, mentioned, uh, oh, some corporate owner bought up a bunch of houses in Oakland. And I'm like, oh, I saw those houses disappear. I saw them go off the map. And I feel like during that period, you know, 12, 14 years ago, there were changes in rules and laws to allow people, you know, just like, like in broadcasting, to allow people to own more broadcasting units, to allow for this corporate ownership, because I felt like there was really a shift since then to where the starter home has become a much more difficult thing to attain here, uh, given this. And so anyways, with that in mind, I'd love to talk a little bit about what your reporting has explored around that issue. That is a fascinating story that you experienced firsthand, what happened uh, around that, the mortgage crisis in 2008. This project that we did, this year-long project looking at property records, one of our goals was to uncover some of the most powerful landlords or People connected to properties were actually legally not allowed to say landlords because of how property ownership works. It's like such a weird wow. thicket. Our lawyers told us that um, <laughs> we might get sued because the way that a lot of these owners work is that, you know, it'll be one guy. Let's take Veritas as an example, actually. So this one guy, Yat Peng Ao, during the 2008 crisis, he purchased thousands of housing units in San Francisco but he is not listed as the owner on any of the buildings that he is connected to. He has various companies that are listed as the manager of the LLC that owns the house or the apartment. Wow. <laughs> and each LLC owns a different building. So legally, I'm not allowed to say landlord. So we're calling them power players in our stories, the people that are kind of controlling vast swaths of the Bay Area housing market. And one thing that we uncovered in this story that we did was that a lot of these really big power players, people who are connected to a lot of different homes, are people who saw this opportunity when the housing market collapsed and they bought up, with the help of investors, tons of homes. So, you know, the two people that come to mind when you tell your story about Oakland to me are Michael Marr, who has a couple of companies, um, mostly some variation of the name Community Fund. Michael Marr, at this point, uh, is linked to almost 600 homes in East Oakland and purchased many more than that, but has since sold off some. Uh, and Michael Marr was actually indicted by the U.S. Justice Department for um, unfairly rigging auctions for houses, and he was put in prison um, for several years, but he still uh, is listed as the owner on these LLCs that own, you know, all these properties. And then the other person that comes to mind for me is Neil Sullivan, who owns this company called REO Homes and um, also owns the management company that goes along with REO Homes. And he is tied to almost or maybe a little over 300 homes in West Oakland because um, a lot of folks defaulted on their mortgages out there and Sullivan raised, you know, tens of millions of dollars from investors to purchase tons of homes there around that time and now rents them out. And in some cases to the same families that lost control of their homes at that time. That breaks my heart. Yeah, it's... It's tough because Sullivan really positions himself as like a community person, a community minded person. He's created all of these community centers in West Oakland and his employees plant trees in the area. But at the same time, it's like he's also, you know, making people pay rent who used to own these homes. And it's it's. It's, yeah, it, it, it feels a little tragic to me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's funny that Michael Marr went to prison for something that I don't know about you, but I have I have a couple of friends and acquaintances who 
uh, have gone to auctions. Or, and, and I remember when I was looking to buy in another situation, I was talking to one of them and they're like, oh, actually that you shouldn't go to that auction because you know what? Everybody knows each other. And so they sort of, they bid on one and one will bid on as if it were just, this is how it, it works. Not that this is illegal, right? Yeah. It's so funny. Like what is legal and what's not in certain cases. So th- this kind of thing, this sort of corporate ownership, you mentioned it's difficult for someone to go get their starter home. It's difficult for, you know, someone who's, uh, who's owned and who had a, a bad mortgage now has to rent the same home. And, you know, that has a real impact on generational wealth. It has a real impact on community connection, et cetera. So Oakland used to be a place where a lot of predominantly Black families had some generational wealth through the homes that they bought, especially because Oakland is, you know, one of the fastest appreciating real estate markets probably in the country. It's part of the Bay Area. It's a very desirable place to live. And as a result of all of these, you know, defaults and the the financial crisis and corporate investors buying these homes, it means that, you know, hundreds to thousands of those families don't have access to that generational wealth anymore. Um, And that's actually a pattern with corporate owners of housing across the country. The Washington Post did an investigation that I looked at um, and really followed from my reporting, and they found that Corporate investors' home ownership tend to be concentrated in neighborhoods that have a higher share of Black people and Black residents than the average neighborhood. And we found that was the case with one of our biggest, actually, I think our single biggest um, owner or uh, company tied to homes, right? Uh, invitation homes. So they're like one of the biggest owners of rental housing in the country, we found them tied to over 1,600 homes in the Bay Area. And those homes were almost entirely located in cities in the Bay Area that had far larger shares of Black residents than the rest of the area. So overall, I think the Bay Area is only about 6% Black, but invitation homes properties are concentrated in Richmond, Vallejo, Antioch, um, Fairfield, all places that are 15 to 20 percent black. So it tends to, yeah, it, it kind of follows. I, I think it's just like places that are gentrifying rapidly, places where people are getting priced out and places like invitation homes are coming in and saying, oh, well, this is a great return on investment for us and our shareholders. And the effect of that, you, you know, you talk about this in one of your stories. Um, there's the community engagement on the person living in the home side. But there's also a community engagement aspect that you pointed out uh, amongst the quote owners or power players or companies that are overseeing these homes. And that is that they aren't thinking about community in the same way that someone would if it were a single owner or someone who lived there. I will say that when I reached out to some of these companies for comment, they disputed that. Invitation Homes talks a lot about the fact that it is really large and has a lot of resources means that it can actually do more to renovate homes and, you know, make people feel comfortable and like they have a really good home experience than a smaller mom and pop landlord, for instance. They talk a lot about community responsibility in their corporate materials on their website. Um, Neil Sullivan, one of the guys I was talking about, he also really talks about how he's a community person. Um, he has fought like proposals to build coal shipping corridors in West Oakland, for instance, which was like, you know, undoubtedly a positive thing that he did. But I think, yeah, when you are purchasing all these homes that otherwise could potentially be available to people who would be the single owner of their homes, it just kind of raises the question of what is a home. You're listening to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. We're talking with Susie Nielsen, data reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle about Bay Area corporate real estate. I think that was one thing I thought a lot about because to a family, it's a place to live. It also can be an investment. It can be a place where you can store wealth and, and gain equity. But, you know, there are so many ways to do that. And um, primarily for a person who owns their own home, it's your residence. It's like where you sleep, where you eat, where you send your kids to school from, all of that. And when you're a corporation, a home is a place to profit from. And that there's probably positives and negatives to, to that. But I think a lot of people 
are just kind of automatically averse to the idea that a home is primarily an investment vehicle. Um, that's not what they started out as. Yeah. Yeah. And I think if we're not having this conversation, I mean, I think it's it's shifting a little bit, but this idea amongst, uh, I guess, older generations that, well, you just get out, you get your starter home, you get started. And that's really unattainable now for a lot of reasons. But it feels as if this is becoming a greater and greater reason why that aspect of uh, moving into adulthood is is different now than it was decades ago. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's also really challenging for developers to to pencil out certain projects and starter homes are increasingly more expensive. So the the overall dynamic of the Bay Area housing market in particular means it's just like so hard to, um, I mean, even what would have been a starter home 30 years ago, like a smaller home is now $2 million. Right, right. It's true. I'm like, I could have afforded that 20 years ago. Nope, not anymore. Yeah. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yeah. Um, so where, where did this, and I, and I, I mean, recognizing that there are all kinds of aspects to this, we're talking about this one thing, but where did this corporate ownership model really start to take hold? Um, you mentioned, and I actually have only seen it in print, REITs, REITs, R-E-I-T. When did this shift start to happen? Where in real estate and the housing market did this shift start to happen from individual ownership to corporate ownership, or has it always been this way? Yeah, I definitely don't think it's always been this way. And I think that the... 2008 crisis really did cause a shift. Um, I'm actually not totally sure exactly how long the concept of a REIT has been around, but a REIT stands for Real Estate Investment Trust. These are typically very large and typically publicly traded companies on some kind of stock exchange. And they primarily serve as a company or a group of companies that purchase or finance real estate. And the idea is that you know, even if you don't own your own home, you can own some portion of the real estate market. And if the housing market is doing well, then you can be too, even if you don't have your own house. People who are proponents of REITs talk about them as democratizing housing ownership in a way, because these are publicly traded companies. But again, I think it signals this new era. People are seeing real estate as this really attractive, high value investment with really high returns. Um, And I'm curious to see what this recession will bring, if, if we do indeed have a recession, single family home values are actually predicted to not really rise over the next year. So I'm curious whether that will shift people's attitudes towards REITs. But REITs can also own apartments. Um, it's just been an interesting, definitely a huge shift in how we think about housing in America. I think you mentioned that REITs have been around since the 60s, but the way they're used or the way, the way they're allowed to be used shifted, I think, maybe in the 80s. You've talked about how you're unable to call this individual an owner because LLCs are set up and companies, et cetera. And I'd love to kind of dive into that, the idea of an LLC versus an individual and sort of the idea of accountability. Because some of the some of the people you talk to in your reporting, and we've heard other stories anecdotally about renters who want to rent, but who feel like they can't get something fixed or they're getting um, sort of threatening messages about rental payments or evictions and are unable to track down someone to hold accountable or to get additional information from. So I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about what you found about how maybe LLC ownership versus individual ownership affects this idea of accountability and affects the quality of life in one of these homes? That's a great question. I guess I'll start with why people are frustrated with some of these LLC owners and larger corporate owners. I was really interested in this analysis that uh, Matthew Desmond, who's he's this eviction researcher at Princeton University, he actually testified to the U.S. Senate about the issue of corporate home ownership. He has cited research showing that corporate owners are more likely to neglect their properties than non-corporate investors, and they often invest in these lower income neighborhoods. So I think that already is frustrating for people who lease from one of these companies and then find themselves at the receiving end of neglect um, or a lot of steep fees. I've also heard from a lot of people that these larger companies have implemented kind of across the board late fees that kick in if you're like a minute late on your rent. Um, And then they'll charge fees on the fees. And it can be really frustrating for people who are trying to get out of debt, for example. And then I think compounded by that is the 
feeling that you don't know who you're renting from because California, like most other states in the U.S., does not require the owner of an LLC doesn't have to put their real name on any corporate documents. So one thing that was really frustrating for me in this project was I would find the owner of a property in our data. It would be, you know, Green Tree LLC. I would look them up in the California Secretary of State database I would look through all the corporate documents, and the only name I could find on the document was the name of some kind of uh, paralegal or attorney that had been hired by whoever it was who owned it, and it made it almost impossible to trace ownership. And the only way, often the only way you, you can do it is just by spending hours in front of the computer, like doing one Google search after the other, like trying to trace back to the owner. And sometimes you can't do it. Like there were some cases where I just couldn't even find out who actually owned it. There are proposals in California continuing, like certain advocacy groups are trying to make the state implement laws that would require the beneficiary owner, which is like the actual, like where the buck stops owner of the LLC. But I don't think those proposals have gotten that far yet. And I think the average person who walks around in society doesn't even realize that, and would think that this is maybe ridiculous, and yet this is how they can set things up. You know, I was going to ask you about your reporting, and I'm glad you mentioned it, but it, it did seem like a, a great deal of work went into putting this together, um, and and you mentioned it because it wasn't just a straightforward, it was the triangulation, It was, and you mentioned in one of the articles, sometimes it was even a letter from a tenant that had a name on it that allowed you, or an address that you could... Um, you know, so I was wondering if you want to address a little bit in more detail the work that went into this and how your team approached it and and where some of the roadblocks came and how you tried to overcome this. Yeah, I did the craziest things to verify ownership. I remember, I don't know if you've ever done this before, but you can like inspect the code underneath a web page. Uh, it's called inspect element. Oh yeah, I totally inspect. Yeah. Yep, I totally do that. And I had to do that a few times to figure out who was like funding the website of, a, of an apartment. I was like, this is so ridiculous. This project, I would say the biggest data project that the Chronicle has ever done. It took over a year. Um, we started out by hoping that we could easily get data from all the nine Bay Area counties. Um, we'd seen this project in Chicago called the Find My Landlord Map. It was by a political group, but we figured, oh, this would be a really interesting journalism project. Like, what if we made a map of all the properties in the Bay Area and let people look up who the property owner was? So we requested data from all nine Bay Area counties. Um, We requested it from their assessor's offices. And a property assessor is someone who, like, you know, assesses the value of a home. So they have data on every property in the county. So we got that data, but it was really hard to get it. And in some cases, they charged us like $500 for the data, wow. um, which is technically public, but they you know, find ways to charge you like, oh, it's going to take a lot of time to get this in the right format, that kind of thing, which is when I feel lucky to be working for a newspaper so I don't have to pay for it myself. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so we did that. We got that. The next issue was that all the data was in different formats. So we had to put it all in one format. And then our real problem started, which is that the person listed as the owner on the property wasn't always the real owner or the owner was misspelled or there was no owner listed on the property. And so we basically spent the next year trying to figure out, is there a better way to find out who owns every property? And we kind of determined at the end of the day that we couldn't find the true owner of every property. There just wasn't enough information in the data. But we could really look at some of the larger groups of properties um, and try and kind of determine the true ownership of those and look at those groups to see if they owned other properties that they were hiding. And we did that by, instead of looking at owner name, we looked at registered mailing address because Property owners are less likely to obscure their mailing address as they are to obscure their owner name, whether intentionally or not. So we found out that the mailing address is the better way to do that. And we found, you know, some of the biggest rental companies by mailing address. And then 
you know, that process took a few months and just like tracking down what else they owned through like, I used a bunch of code. I used a bunch of, you know, public records. I used stuff like, you know, inspecting elements of websites. So then we made maps of what they all owned and we're probably missing a lot still, but it was like a really super interesting process. And as much as we learned about all of this, we also learned that there's so much we still don't know. And there are probably a lot of larger owners that are hiding in plain sight just because of the way that they register their information. Wow. Wow. How many people are on the team? How many people are involved in this? Oh my God. The overall number of people that were credited on the package was like over 20, but that was like in the design and implementation of it. The core team consisted of my colleague, Emma Stiefel, who's a developer, she spent so much time working on this project. She's like kind of the heart of it. I also spent a ton of time and then we had two editors working on it. And then we had a couple of reporters coming in too and helping out. Uh, but we also had designers, we had photographers, we had other editors, we had a lawyer that like talked to us for hours about not saying landlord <laughs> and other things that we had to exclude. Um, so yeah, lots of people were involved. So that brings me to the question of why. I mean, I'm grateful you did it. I'm so thankful for what it contributes to our understanding. But why did you decide to take this on? We thought that, first of all, it's so important to know who owns property and like one of the most contested high value property markets in the country, if not the most. We just thought it was very newsworthy and also in the public interest. I'm really interested and drawn to projects that empower readers and get them excited about data, that get them excited about records and transparency and like local government. And I thought this project was a way to give people a tool that they wouldn't have had access to before. So, you know, that map that we made where you can look up who owns your property. A lot of people who are academic researchers, tenant organizers, um, just local people who are interested in finding out who owns their building, they've been using that tool a lot. And I feel like that's just been an amazing thing to see. And then also, I think nobody else is going to do this. I think the Chronicle is one of the bigger data teams on the West Coast and probably the biggest team serving the Bay Area. And I don't know how many other folks would have the kind of skills that Emma has to really decode this data. So we thought nobody else is going to do it but us. So let's do it. So what can we do? What can your readers do to help solve this? It's really hard. I think if you're just one person, it's very tricky. I do think it's cool. Some of the work that land trusts are doing in the Bay Area, like purchasing homes and then selling them at affordable prices to families who've been here for a long time. So supporting those is good. (laughs) Well, given that it's a tricky and difficult situation, what do you want people to take away from this? Um, You did it, you put it out there. Why should people care? I want people to ask their government for more. I think the fact that there is no centralized resource for people to look up their landlord is appalling given that when we apply to rent a place, we give so much of our information to our landlord, our prospective landlord, and it should go both ways. I'm hoping that people, when they look at this project, they say, why isn't my government providing me with this? And what can I demand and ask for as a tenant? And how do I work on getting that to happen? So I'm hoping that like sparks interest in people to like learn more about how property ownership works and what they can do to kind of have power in their own status. Thank you to my guest, Susie Nielsen, data reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle. You can find links to Susie and her team's reporting, as well as the interactive maps on Bay Area real estate and corporate ownership at newsincontext.net. Music in this episode includes Spring Fling by Track Tribe, and The Heist by Silent Partner. In addition to hearing news in context every Friday at 8.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. on KSFP 102.5 in San Francisco, you can hear it on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, iHeartMedia, Google Play, Google Podcasts, Podbean, YouTube, and PRX. We're also on Facebook and Twitter at News in Context SF and on Instagram at News in Context. And you can find links to all of that at newsincontext.net. I'm Gina Valeria. Thank you for listening.